Good morning. Very warm welcome to everyone at our worship service this morning. Just a few announcements, the first being that we start with Junior Church next Sunday here in the service, and all our young folk are welcome to join us for that. So please spread the word if you know of any um, who would wish to join. Then feel free to watch our weekly reflection on our Facebook page. So uh, each week um, I'm posting a video this uh, week I'm working on the theme of the stones that we carry along with us and how to put them down um, instead of keeping on carrying them with us so um, under various themes. So this um, coming week will be the first of these stones and how to put them down. So you're welcome to, to have a look at that on our Facebook page. And then very importantly and very joyously today we will be having coffee and tea afterwards. Um, I know many folk are very happy about that. Can I ask though, there's just a few things given that, that COVID's not gone completely, as we all know. It's very much still around. And this is all about managing the risk um, when we're having coffee and tea. So I would want to ask everyone, if you wish to stay for coffee and tea, please remain seated after the service until everyone has left who wish to go. Because the thing is, we don't want people bumping into each other in the aisles, because some of you are going to want to make your way towards the coffee and tea. Some are going to want to go outside, and it's just minimizing that interaction. So if you wish to stay for coffee and tea, please remain seated after the service until everybody else has left. And then when it comes to the coffee and tea, although standing service is allowed now, according to Scottish government rules, um, the Church of Scotland guidance asks that folk please be seated when you take off your mask. So please, um, I know you can't, it, it's um, a very risky exercise trying to drink your coffee through your mask and I'm sure over the last two years many of us have accidentally tried this. Um, it doesn't work as you will all surely know. So you're welcome to take your mask off of course when you're having your coffee and tea, but please do so when you're, sit when you're seated and not standing around the coffee area in close proximity to each other. That would be the only request we have and try to remain um, as far apart as possible while still being able to hold a bit of a conversation. Um, so uh, we, in we invite all of you to enjoy some uh, coffee and tea with us after the service. As we start with our worship this morning, let's listen to the words of Psalm 66 verses one to four as our call to worship. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Amen. Let's start by singing our own praises, not singing our own praises, singing praise to God in our own way, singing hymn 111, Holy, Holy, Holy.
so today I want to show you a magic trick. I am going to, let me first sanitize my hands, as we do these days. Over here I have a jug of water on the empty glass. Now, who of you believe me that standing here where I'm standing at the moment, I will be able to pour that water into that glass without coming closer or touching them. I can see some of you saying, stranger things have happened. But you're not quite sure. Who thinks I'll be able to do it? <laughs> There's a few faces saying, oh, I'm not just sure anymore that he's not able to do it. Um, okay, so are you ready? I'm going to show you my trick now, getting the water from that jug into the glass without me coming closer or touching it. Are you ready? Okay, one, two, oh, I almost forgot the most important part. A bribe. Um, Brona, you're unfortunately the youngest person in the service today, so no pressure if you don't want to, but do you think I could get you to pour water into that glass if I give you a chocolate eclair? Please come to the front and show me. <laughs> yes, Carlene, unfortunately, this is your personal provisions. <laughs> I told you I'd be able to do it. Brona, thank you very much. Help yourself to take more than one, please. Take some for your mom as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> give her a hand. <laughs> actually, I should say, give me a hand, because I actually managed to get the water into the glass without touching it. Many of you seriously doubted my ability to be able to do that. And rightly so, because what is needed to get the water from there into there? I can't hear. Action. We need a body to do it, don't we? Now, I know we, we are all very used to watching um, magicians at um, concerts or on TV doing all kinds of stuff, and I'm sure if I had the right equipment, I could have had you all gasping for your breath today by the glass simply filling up with water. But we all know and we're all at the age, I think, where we all know that now, that that's all mostly smoke and mirrors. There is some physical action happening that makes these things happen. Now, I needed Brona to come up to pour the water into the glass. I promised you that I would be able to do it. I didn't say how. <laughs> I just said I would be able to do it. A physical body, a person, a flesh and blood person was needed to come up to the front to take... Um, the jug and to pour it into the glass. Now today we're going to be talking again where we're, um, our gospel reading is still uh, John 6, that part after Jesus had uh, fed the 5,000 with uh, the, the bread and the fish. And they're still asking him questions and still pursuing him. And he says, I am the bread of life. And we're going to read from the Old Testament about the temple and how the temple was seen by the people of the time and by Solomon as the seat of God, a physical place. And we're going to reflect on how, as humans, we tend to, unfortunately, as people of faith, distinguish between physical and spiritual, between temporal and spiritual. Whereas in the Bible, we can see that these things are actually more intertwined. And that means that God works in our world but most, more often than not, not like God needs a person to do everything for him. God is almighty. But more often than not, God does the things he does in this world through physical bodies, through people willing to be his hands and his feet in this world. As Brona was, for that moment, an extension of myself doing what I wanted her to do. So that is the theme for today. 
I'm just going to take this away. Save you all becoming very thirsty during a very lengthy sermon. Let us pray. Ancient of days, holy mystery, El Shaddai, God, we call on you by the names we have, taking on our lips words that cannot contain you. You are always more, and as we turn to you, you have already turned to us and called on us. My people, my beloved, to wait before you and meditate on you, this is what restores us, Lord, to know again that you are the living God, this is what reawakens our hope. So we gather in your presence and offer you our love and thanks for keeping the world turning, for infusing all that exists with the breath of your Spirit, for looking on us with warmth and pride because we are yours. We pray in the names of your community of love, source, saviour, sustainer. God, you know us well. We are not always at our best. Sometimes we get weary, our smiles fade, our energy runs low. And in a depleted state, we become bad company. Sometimes we fail to look after ourselves and blame others for our unmet needs. Sometimes we despair that our good work does not count for much and we retreat into paralysis. Hear our sorrow and untangle us, good Lord. You do not condemn, you forgive. Thank you, Lord, that you do not create lost causes, but that you create human beings in your own beautiful likeness. Recreate us today for your love's sake. Hear us as we give words to our thirst for your grace in the words of the prayer Jesus taught his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn 120, God we praise you, God we bless you.
Our first reading is from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, chapter 8, verses 1. Now, this is where Eleanor, I had to um, give her some guidance. Of, uh, she's very smart enough to, to figure it out herself, but it's very, it's very broken up, the different readings. So we're reading verses 1, verses 6, verses 10 to 11, verses 22 to 30, and verses 41 to 43. Um, and with a lot of compassion, um, Eleanor <laughs> is going to read for us this morning. Thank you. And King Solomon summoned into his presence at Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the Israelite armies, to bring up the ark of the Lord's covenant from Zion, the city of David. <coughs> the priests then brought the ark of the Lord's covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord, in front of the whole assembly of Israel, spread out his hands towards heaven and said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. Now Lord, the God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him when you said, you shall never fail to have a successor to sit before you on the throne of Israel. If only your descendants are careful in all they do to walk before me faithfully as you have done. And now, God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David, my father, come true. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy, Lord, my God. Hear the cry of the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. May your eyes be opened towards this temple day and night. This place of which you said, my name shall be there. So that you will hear the prayer your servant prays towards this place. Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people, Israel, when they pray towards this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. As for the foreigner, who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. Hymn 154, O Lord my God.
56 to 69 and uh, we're still exploring the part where the crowds were pursuing Jesus after he had fit the, the 5,000 with the bread and the fish. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. May God grant his blessing to these readings from his holy word. I recently saw a post on social media that caught my attention. It was a picture of a man about to dig a hole. Now this man was leaning against a shovel looking rather tired and spent, which was surprising because there wasn't, you know, there was no hole to show for it. But the subtitle of the picture said, God is in control, but he doesn't expect you to lean on a shovel and pray for a hole. I found this really funny and at the same time containing so much truth. As a Christian, I am certainly guilty of sometimes escaping into a spiritual place where praying about the crises and laments of this world is all that I can do. But it is easy to get stuck there and forget that I am also a physical being in this world with hands and feet to actively do something about it. In our readings today, we encounter both in the story of Solomon placing the Ark of the Covenant in the temple and in Jesus' words to the crowds and his disciples' valuable example of God's physical presence in this world. In the Old Testament reading, Solomon dedicates the temple by placing the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. Now we must remember that the Ark was seen as the physical embodiment of God's presence for the Israelites. The temple remained incomplete until the Ark was placed there. Even in the minds of the religious people of the time, God was not just some spirit in the sky, but was linked physically to this world. The temple would become the place where God lived as long as his presence was there. The Israelites needed God not to be just an abstract concept, but to be physically present in their world. They needed a place where they could be in God's presence. Solomon goes on in his prayer to expand on how God is so much more than the ark and how he cannot be contained in place and time. But how wonderful it is that he is also with them physically. Now in the gospel reading, Jesus is trying to teach the masses who have started pursuing him rather than just following him 
after the feeding of the masses with five loaves of bread and two fish. They want another sign. They beg him for another miracle. Then Jesus tells them that he is the bread of life. This confuses them and raises more questions than answers. Jesus continues in our reading to drive home the physical nature of what he was saying by telling the crowds that the bread he will give them to eat is his own body. Now, this is too much for them. And we see the crowds turning away in disgust. They miss the point completely. Jesus is telling them that God's love is not just some abstract concept somewhere in heaven. He, the physical person of Jesus, the actual physical presence of God's love, is among them. And he hints towards the fact that this love will be expressed not just spiritually, but physically as well, and quite distressingly, when his physical body is broken and beaten. The problem is, as people of faith, we sometimes tend to divide things into that which is spiritual and that which is temporal. We more often than not do not realize that the thought that we are simply spiritual beings caught up in physical bodies is actually not an understanding that is based on the Bible. This idea of our human bodies being mere physical containers for our souls is based upon a philosophy by a Greek man by the name of Plato. And through the history of Christianity, this has been labeled a heresy and is called radical dualism. The belief that we are somehow spirits caught up in some physical body. Believing that we can completely divide the physical and the spiritual and believing that one has nothing to do with the other. When in fact, the Bible and especially the Gospels teach us that God entered our world in physical form through Jesus. The only way to show humanity the way to God had to be physical. It had to be expressed physically in a child born just like us, growing up to become a man just like us, but being able to do so much more. People were reading from the scriptures of this time that God cared and that he loved them, but it only became believable when Jesus touched the lepers healed the sick, gave sight to the blind. When Jesus fed the hungry and invited the lowliest of society to share a physical meal, only then did God become a reality to them. In Jesus, as we saw in our reading of John chapter 6, and in the temple as seen in our Old Testament reading, the spiritual and the physical collide. The implications of this for us living here in Scotland in 2021 are extensive. The fact that God is not only found in reading our Bibles, praying and singing hymns, but is also a physical presence where his love and grace is shown asks of us to do more than send love and prayers to those in need. It asks of us to do more than to be mindful of those who are alone and isolated. It asks us to not only apply our minds when it comes to serving God, but also to apply our bodies, to physically go where there is need, to use our hands and our feet, not only to proclaim the love of God, but to be it. 
When Jesus addresses the crowds following him in the hope of another miracle, he tells them that he is the miracle. He is the embodiment of God's love for this world. He is the bread, not just the giver of it. In fact, if you read the whole gospel according to John, there are seven I am declarations by Jesus. Telling people that these things they are yearning for, these things they are looking for, he is those things. He is the physical embodiment of all God's love. The physical presence of God in Jesus is so crucial that we celebrate it when we have a special meal called the Lord's Supper. And although the bread and wine serves as a physical reminder of Jesus' love for us in dying on the cross, through all of history, our faith has been incomplete without the physical signs of God being with us. The challenge to all of Christianity is, of course, to not only be recipients of God's love, but to also be the expression of it. To not limit our faith to thinking, praying, and singing, but to be hands and feet in a world where God's physical presence is needed now more than ever. Physical bodies are needed to fly planes with refugees from Afghanistan to places of safety. Physical bodies are needed to pour soup into bowls and hand it to the hungry. Physical bodies are needed to embrace the bereaved. Physical bodies are needed to listen, to open our doors to the rejected. Faith does not begin and end in our hearts and our heads. It is intertwined with our bodies as well. I end with another post I saw on social media. A man sitting on a bench next to Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, of course, asking him, why is there so much pain and suffering in this world? Why are you not doing anything about it? Jesus answers him, that's strange. I was about to ask you the same thing. Amen. Let's listen to our organ, organ voluntary while we reflect on our readings and our sermon this morning. Multi-talented, multitasking God, it is from you that we derive our creative instincts. We are markers, makers and crafters, designers and builders of relationship and social systems, of ideas and projects, of agreements and policies, of tools and artworks. Thank you that our lives are the better for what has been made by hands and minds of our own generation and those older and younger. 
Thank you for those whose skill and faith, time and money, whose hands and feet have brought into being houses of prayer, sanctuaries of worship. Thank you for all the ways that cathedrals, temples, monasteries have served your purposes, making physically visible a glimpse of your glory and grandeur, moving people into an encounter with you, speaking of the longer story we are but a small part of. Today we pray for our brothers and sisters across the world who long for the freedoms we take for granted, to worship together in a dedicated building or anywhere. We hold before you the people of Afghanistan facing an uncertain future. Images of people clinging to airplanes to escape persecution has shocked and saddened us. Help us find a way as people to embody your love and compassion for the people of Afghanistan rather than just sending our thoughts and prayers. Move us to be a physical presence of your comfort and protection to those who have lost loved ones and are themselves at risk of injury, torture or death. We cry out to you for a world able to live and let live, a world able to celebrate the diverse stands of belief and ritual, affirming our common ground of treating others as we wish them to treat us. Help us be your physical presence of acceptance and love when we simply sit with the rejected. Give us a curiosity for other ways of understanding you. Surprise us with the insights of other paths to you. You are mystery. You are intimacy. Give yourself to us that we may give ourselves and our bodies to you and bring alive your kindness and compassion in all we do. These and all the other concerns we carry in our hearts, we bring in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn 251, I the Lord of Sea and Sky.
Now go in peace and receive the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of Jesus Christ bring you into movement to be a physical presence of grace to those in need of compassion. May the love of God find its way through your hands and feet to those who find it hard to love themselves. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit compel you to sit with the lonely and the outcast.